So this morning, if you have your Bible with you, I want to look at Philippians chapter number three. And we'll start at verse number 10. And it's kind of outlining why we should not have confidence in our flesh, why we should not trust in our flesh, why we should not trust in our own strength and have confidence in our own strength. Because even though it may seem good on the surface, it's limited. And whether we like it or not, our strength on our own is limited. Who we are on our own is limited. So he's outlining the fact that we're limited, but Christ is unlimited. Jesus has absolutely no limits. So we can put our trust in his strength. We can put our trust in his confidence. We can put our trust in who he is and in his power. And so he's outlining this in in Philippians 3.10. And it says, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings. Becoming like him in his death. And so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Now, it does not get much more powerful than that. Does not get much more magnificent than that, than the resurrection from the dead. Verse 12, not not that I have already obtained all of this or have already arrived at my goal. I love this, Paul is the author, he's the one writing, and he says, hey, I haven't arrived yet. Like this is Paul, who we look to as a great man of faith. He says, I haven't arrived yet. And it would do a lot of us a lot of good this year if we would go ahead and acknowledge, hey, contrary to what I thought, I haven't arrived yet. Contrary to what I wanted, I haven't haven't arrived yet. I still have some growth to do. Despite what I thought, I haven't arrived. He said, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on. I press on. If there was no resistance, he would not have to press. If there was no adversity, he would not have to press. If it was easy, he would not have to press. He says, I've got to press on because this thing's not easy. It's not simple. It's not like I'm tiptoeing through the tulips like my dad loves to say. He says, it's not simple and easy, so I got to press on. I've got to press. He says, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. I love Paul's honesty here, y'all. I love, because see, I, I believe that, that one of the reasons that we struggle a lot in church is because people that are in leadership try to act like they're perfect and we put people that are in leadership on a pedestal. And so when something happens, our whole world is fallen and our whole belief in Jesus is fallen because we've turned the person that was human into our idea of who Jesus is. It's not even in my notes. I don't know where this comes from. So, so I love that Paul is honest and says, hey, I mess up sometimes. I don't get it perfect all the time. Don't look to me because I'm not the one who died on the cross for you and rose again, Jesus is. But I love his honesty because he says, listen, he says, I have not arrived yet. I haven't made it yet. I haven't haven't quite accomplished what I wanna accomplish in my walk with Christ yet. I haven't made it fully there yet. And then he also says, He says, but you know what? I'm not going to allow that to stop me. And I tell you what I'm not going to do. I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to stop pressing. I'm not going to stop trying. I'm not going to stop believing. And then he takes it a step further and he says, listen, I haven't always gotten it right in my life. And and there's some things that I've messed up, but I'm not going to allow my failures to stop me from trying to push on. I'm not going to allow what I messed up before to stop me from pressing 
on. He said, I'm striving towards what's ahead. I cannot go back and undo what I did. I can't go back and change where I failed. I can't go back and switch all these things up that I wish I could. So instead of going back and worrying about all that, I'm going to press on. I'm going to press on. See, we cannot allow our past mistakes and, and the past times that we failed or the past times that we didn't get it right to stop us from pressing on. So this morning, I wanna to talk to you for these few moments on the subject, press on. Press on, tell somebody, press on. Press on. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for today and we just thank you for who you are. Lord, we thank you for each and every one of us that's gathered here today, that you love each and every one of us enough to meet with us individually. Lord, I pray that you would speak, <coughs> that you would speak to our hearts, that you would help us to hear from you, Lord, to see from you, not to hear and see from me. Lord, I pray that you would help us to take what is spoken and to apply it to our lives so that we can begin to see change as we change. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. Well, Christmas is kind of officially, officially over, right? It's official. Like, like if you have your Christmas up and I see it, it's going to make me sad because I love Christmas so much, like love it, but when it's done, it's done, right? When Christmas is done, Christmas is done, and I'm ready for the Christmas decorations to be put up and everything to be put away, so hopefully you've been getting your Christmas decorations put up, but the thing about Christmas that's kind of weird is that it gives people in a relationship not only the, the, the opportunity to keep secrets from their significant other, but it's actually kind of encouraged, is this like weird to anybody else? It's encouraged that you keep secrets so that you can surprise them with the gift that you're buying them for Christmas. And I used to love, absolutely love getting Christmas presents when Nicole and I were dating, right? Whenever she would buy me something, I loved it. But now that we're married, I don't love it as much because anytime she buys me something, I have to watch the money go out of our bank account, right? <laughs> our joint bank account. So when she gets me a gift, I'm like, thanks, I hope it was free because I have to watch the money go out of our bank account, not just hers, but ours. So back uh, a, few, a few weeks ago, we were talking about Christmas and all these things, and she was like, listen, don't look at the bank account. I'm like, I don't like the sound of that. She said, don't look at the bank account. It's Christmas time. If you look, I know you like to watch. You're going to see what I got you, blah, blah, blah. So I was like, okay, you know, that's fine. I won't look. Until some packages started showing up at our house. And it was like every day there was a UPS or an Amazon package. And I was like, I got to do some investigative looking into our bank account. So I looked at our bank account, even though I said that I wouldn't. Like I told you, pastors are not perfect. I said I wouldn't do it. I did it anyway. I apologize, but I did it anyways. So, so I looked at the bank account, and I was like, go! Like, ah! I said, listen, hear me, big spender. Let's, talk, let's reel it in a little bit, okay? It's only December 1st. Like, let's reel it in a little bit. We got a long ways to go. And she, she, she went into this whole, whole story, okay, this whole story about how, you know, we have two kids now and how she doesn't want Elijah to feel left out because he's the second child, even though dude's never going to know because he's only four months old. Then she's like, and you know, in Judah, Judah, I don't want him to feel left out because he's the first child. I don't want him to think that he's been replaced, and then she's like, and you, you're the OG, like you're, you were there before all of them, and I don't want you to feel left out, so I got to get you some stuff so that you don't feel left out. And she said, and then we got friends we got to get stuff for, and family we got to get stuff for, and our friends' kids we got to get stuff for, and their dogs, and their cats, and I said, nope, and their hamsters, and all these things. And she's like, we got to get, you know, things for all these people, and I'm like, okay, okay, like I get it. I hear your heart. I appreciate your heart. You know, it's fine. Let's just, from this point on, like, not spend any more money. And so I'm not your typical husband, okay? And what I mean by that is I notice things, right? Like, I know, like, some of you ladies, you're like, you go get your hair done. You, you know, go spend hundreds of dollars getting your hair done, your nails done, all this stuff. Come home, and your husband has no idea. I notice things. I notice the hair. I notice the nails. And then I started noticing 
over the next few days that I'm like, I don't think she had those pants before. And I'm like, I'm, pr- I'm pretty sure that that's a new shirt. I could be wrong, but that looks like a new shirt. Are those, those are new shoes. They ain't on my feet, they're on her feet. I'm like, she's got a new watch band. She got new like hair pull up things, you know, whatever you do, ladies. I don't know. She got all this new stuff. And see, some of y'all are like me. You're like, oh, ho, ho. like you, you've caught on. You're like, oh, the whole, the, the, the package is a gift for somebody else trick, right? It's a gift for somebody else. But the reality is mama knew she probably wouldn't get what she wanted for Christmas. So she went and got it herself. So she has gathered up all these things. And so I, I was like, you know what? I said, so you want to stick to the story that all these things are for everybody else, for the kids. She said, well, they wouldn't be here without me, so yes. I'm like, okay, I see how it is. I see where we're going. And so I told her, I said, babe, <coughs> I love you and I appreciate you. But I feel like there was more to the story than what you said. I feel like there's more. I could be wrong, but I feel like there's more. You ever looked at your life and felt like there was more? You ever looked at a situation and thought, this is cool, but there's got to be more. Like, this is okay, but there's more. And the author of Philippians 3 here, he says, there's more to life than where I'm at. There's more to the story than even what I've seen myself. There's more to what I've uh, than what I've been told. There's more to this whole deal than what I've experienced. There's more. And that's the first thing I need you to see this morning if you're taking notes, is that Paul said, there's more. There's more. He said in Philippians 3.10, he went on to say, I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. Paul says, I know Christ, but I want to know Christ more than I know him now. I want to know Christ at a deeper level than what I do now. I know him, but, but I feel like I really want to know him. Like there's, there's more to this than what I know. There's more to this than what I've experienced. Simply put, Paul is saying, every time I get to know something more about Christ, the more I learn there is to know about him. And every time I find out more, there's more to know about him. And every time I think I got to the end of knowing everything I need to know about Christ, there's more to know about him. And Paul said, I don't want to settle for where I'm at, but I want to find out more. I don't want to settle for, for just feeling good because I'm Paul the apostle and I'm able to write for the Bible. I want to know more. I want to know Christ more. And Paul's saying, it is time for me, it is time for you, it is time for everyone to stop just kind of floating through their faith and to realize that there's more and to pursue more. To pursue more. He says, I want to know Christ. And this is the same heart that we should have. God, I don't want to just know you. But I want to know you on a deeper level. I want to know you more than just the surface stories I heard in children's church. I want to know you more than just the surface things that I hear even on Sunday morning. God, I want to know you so much more that I'm pursuing you on my own. I'm not waiting on the pastor to lead me there. I'm not waiting on my Elevate group to lead me there. God, I got to know you so I'm going to search on my own. When I'm on my own, this should be our hearts, not just to know Christ, but to know him. Because there is a difference between knowing Christ and knowing Christ. There's a difference. There's a difference but, but, between, between knowing and knowing. It's easy to kind of stop at salvation. It's easy to kind of stop at, well, I'm at church a couple times a month. And I sing the songs. And, and if the message kind of gets my attention, I'll listen. And if I'm feeling real frisky, I'm going to raise my hand and worship, like real frisky. Like, yeah. but, but there's more. There's more. It doesn't just stop at that point, but there's, there's more. Somebody say there's more. there's more. There's more. All of those things are great. They're amazing. 
But the question is, does your Bible or Bible app get open Monday through Saturday? Do, do you pray? Do you pray outside of the couple times that we pray in this hour and a half that we have together on Sunday mornings? Do you ever like turn the radio off of like Lizzo or Ariana Grande or Drake ugh, or, or like Lionel Richie or I don't know whatever your flow is? Do you ever like turn it off and turn on some worship music and just soak for a minute, just like sit there and just pursue God's presence, just soak in his presence while, while listening to worship, while praying, while seeking God? Do you ever like take those moments? Because you realize you don't have to be at church to be in God's presence. I mean, definitely keep coming. We want you to be here to grow, but you don't have to be at church to be in God's presence. You can be in God's presence at your house. You can be in God's presence in your car. You can be in God's presence in the closet. You can be in God's presence in anywhere you want to be, anywhere that you stop long enough to pursue him. Why well, are you saying I got to do all those things to go to heaven? Actually, no. No, I'm not. Because hear me, like contrary to, to popular opinion in church and contrary to what you may have heard, you don't get to heaven by your works. You do not get to heaven by your works. Hear me on that. I want you to know. You do not get to heaven by how much of everything that you do. That's not how you get to heaven. I mean, we want to we tell people that, but it's not true. The moment that you made the decision to follow after Jesus, ask him into your heart and live for him, heaven was promised to you. Heaven was promised to you. All I'm saying is there's more to the life of a follower of Jesus than just that. There is more to the life of a follower of Jesus than just, oh, I'm saved and I'm going to heaven. And it's tempting to become lazy and to live in the peace of, well, I'm going to heaven. I got my ticket punched. Everything's all good. I'm going to be there. But God wants more for us. God is calling us to more. It is time for more. It is time to not just be okay with just walking in the door on Sunday, going home, and living the same way I've always lived. It is time for us to say, God, I am hungry to see more. I am hungry to see more of you, to grow deeper in my walk with you, to grow deeper in my relationship with you, to see more, to not just settle for where I'm at, but to see more. One of the greatest tragedies in church today is that we have become okay with living at status quo. We've become okay with just living, and, and, and if I can just, if I can make it through this life, then I'm getting to heaven. If I can just survive this week, this year, if I can survive whatever America's going through right now, I'm just, I'm fine because I'm going to get to heaven. Just kind of coast through to heaven. And we're fine with just living status quo. But God did not call you to live status quo. He did not call you to just barely get by. He called you to thrive. He called you to excel, to thrive in your life. Are you saying that I get a Lamborghini? No. I'm not talking about financially only. I'm talking about God wants you to thrive mentally, emotionally, spiritually. But we get so focused on all the other things that we forget that we got to pursue God spiritually. We get so busy in turning God into our genie that gives us whatever we want that we miss the opportunity to pursue him the way we're called to pursue him. God is not our genie. He's our partner. We are to be in partnership with him, to pursue him. He loves his children too much to allow us to just kind of coast through life. He loves his children too much to allow us to just kind of just be like, eh, you know, whatever, it is what it is. I'm going to heaven, though. I'm going to heaven. You going to heaven? Cool, we're going to heaven together. But, I mean, I'm not doing anything else his word says while I'm here because I'm going to heaven. Paul says, no, 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 there's more. See, you've, you, you've been wanting more, but you haven't been pursuing more. Because whether you realize it or not, the truth is every single person in this room, every single person joining us online, we know that there's more. 
We know there's more. You know that there is more to life than the part that you're living. You know that there is something greater to your life than where you're at. This is why many of us are frustrated, and hopefully you are frustrated. Because if you're not frustrated, then you don't have drive to see more. So hopefully you're at a point where you're like, I don't know what it is, but there's something missing in my life. Got my rock with Christ, but there's more. There's more. This is where I am as your pastor. I'm like, there's more. There's more. We're seeing people reach Christ, come into a relationship with Christ. 2019, saw 78 people make a commitment of their life to Christ. Awesome things. That's where it starts. But there's more. There's more. God said, go and make disciples. I don't believe that we should just stop at seeing people meet Jesus and then just, all right, good job. You're on your own now. There's more. There's more. We have to be a church of more. We have to be a church that says, God, help me to grow into more. Help me to reach more, to see more. Because the truth is we know that there's more. But you will never see more if you don't pursue more. We think that we could just sit there and everything just happens. We got to (coughs) pursue. It's in our pursuit. When Nicole and I were dating, I knew that I wanted more. I didn't want to be her friend. I didn't want to be her boyfriend. I wanted to be her husband. So I was like, I know that there's more, right? So what did I do? I pursued more. Started showing up with flowers. Started texting her in the morning, hey, beautiful. I pursued more. I didn't just sit by and just like hope that she would just one day call me wanting to marry me. I pursued more. I put together a big plan of how I was going to propose. We got the limo to pick her up. I had the signs reminding her of all of our big steps throughout our relationship. It brought her to the place. I had her bought a new dress. I had her some shoes. I had her some jewelry that she was able to put on to show up. Of course she knew what she was coming to do, but it's okay. I had all these things. She shows up, she's walking through all these areas, and then she comes, and I'm under the speaker's deep. Why? Why did I do all that? Because I was pursuing more than where we were at. I said, I know that we're in a relationship, but I want to be in a relationship. I want more. I want more. But more is at the end of your pursuit. See, if I never would have pursued more, I never would have seen more. And if you don't pursue, you'll never see. What you pursue more of, you see more of. If you want to pursue peace, don't turn on the news. For the love, please don't scroll through Facebook. If you want to pursue peace, turn off your TV, turn off your phone, and pursue the word of God. God, I know that things are crazy. I know people are crazy. My neighbor's crazy. The person I go to church with is crazy. But God, I thank you for your word that I can pursue. If you want to pursue the voice of God, if you want to hear God speak more, don't turn more noise on. Turn everything down and pursue his voice. See, there is more to your life at the end of your pursuit. There is more to your life at the end of your pursuit. But we cannot, we've got to get away from thinking that just because we, we are saved and just because we're going to heaven, that everything just magically happens for us. We gotta get to the point where we're hungry for more of God. We're hungry to pursue more. God, I'm not settling for just where I'm at, but God, I'm pursuing more. There is more. I haven't yet reached where I wanted to be yet, God. So I'm going to pursue more. And then when we do, we take hold of it. So the next thing I need you to see is take hold. Take hold. Paul, he said in verse 12, not that I have already obtained all of this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. I take hold of that for which Christ took hold for me. Paul said, Jesus, 
the Savior of the world took hold of me, how much more so should I want to take hold of what he has to offer? He came down to this earth and took hold of my life. How much more so should I want to pursue and to take hold of all that he has to offer? But I have to press on. I have to press on because it's not, it's not easy. I have to press on because I don't always get it right. I have to press on because it's not just happening easily and always there. I have to press on because I haven't arrived yet. I haven't arrived. And church, hear me on this. And please don't get upset. Please don't, you know, start throwing things at me. But, but the truth is, despite what you think, you have not arrived yet. You haven't arrived yet. I haven't arrived yet. I don't care if you've been in church five minutes. I don't care if you've been in church 50 years. You have not arrived yet. Paul said, the more I get to know him, the more there is to know. You haven't arrived yet. Despite, I know this weird, right? Because we walked in here, some of us walked in, and we were like, hey, you know, I got my new, you know, my new Christmas clothes on, right? I've arrived. I'm looking good. I'm feeling good. And, and now you got to find out, like, you haven't arrived yet. But it's true. Nobody in this room, nobody joining us online has arrived yet. None of us. Despite what your mama told you, my mama told me I arrived. But she's wrong. Only time in her life. She's wrong. She's wrong because there's still room for growth. There's still room for growth. No matter what anybody told you, you have not arrived yet because there is more. There is more. Again, somebody say there's more. There's more. See, Paul said, he said, I press on to take hold because I haven't already arrived yet. I haven't arrived yet. I want to arrive, but I haven't arrived yet. I want to get to that point, but I haven't arrived yet. I want to make it there, but I haven't arrived yet. And he said, he said I, may have, I may have been faced with some adversity, but I press on. I may have made some mistakes, but I press on. I might not have seen what I was hoping for, but I press on. I might be facing some resistance, but I press on. I press on to take hold of that for which Christ died for me. Now, when you take hold of something, when you take hold of it, like I mean really take hold of it, you don't let it go. Put the ring on Nicole's finger. I took hold. Ain't no other man. Nobody else in the world, even if I die. <laughs> Y'all are like, oh, okay. But I was like, I pursued and I took hold. Because when you take hold of something, you don't let it go. When you take hold of something, you're not playing games. Think about it like this. If you're hanging on from a helicopter that has a little bit of rope that's tied to the helicopter and you go to fall out of the helicopter and grab onto that rope, you didn't just grab it. You took hold. You took hold. And you're like, I ain't letting this thing go. The helicopter may go down with me because I ain't going down by myself. I take hold. When you take hold, you're not playing games. When you take hold, you're not just messing around. In other words, you cannot take hold of what God has to offer while also holding on to what your old life has to offer. You, you can't take hold of all that God has while still holding on to all your old life had. And see, this is where it gets tricky for some of us. It's where it gets tricky. Because the truth is, we want to experience the fullness of God in our lives. We want to. Look, at I mean, you're here on Sunday morning, first Sunday of the new year. God, I want to experience the fullness of all that you have to offer. But then, then, Friday night, Saturday, uh, we want to experience the fullness of all that our old life has to offer. We want to experience the fullness of all that God has to offer, but we also want to experience the fullness of all that our flesh has to offer. We want to experience both. So we try to toe this line of righteousness and unrighteousness, right? Like how close can I get to the line where I'm still like righteous, but I'm able to dabble in some unrighteous? How can I take hold 
of what God has to offer and the fullness of what God has to offer, but also take hold of what the world had to offer. How can I toe that line? How can I take hold of both? The truth is you can't. You can't. And what you pursue more of, you see more of. So if you pursue more of righteousness, then you see more righteousness. If you pursue more unrighteousness, then you see more unrighteousness. How can I see the fullness of all that God has to offer? You cannot see the fullness of all God has to offer until you make the decision to go all in and to take hold of it. Take hold of it. God, I want you more than anything else. God, I want you more than the temptation. I want you more than the bad habit. I want you more than those friends. I want you more than that relationship I should have let go 10 years ago. God, I want you more. So I'm pursuing you more. And the truth is, the more that you pursue him, the further away those things get. If it's a struggle, because I understand I've been there before, if it's a struggle to let go of what you know you shouldn't be involved with, Make it your focus to pursue him because the more that you pursue him and the more identity you get in Christ, the less you even want those things and the less they want to be around you in the first place. God, I'm pursuing more. I'm pursuing more. Paul said, I haven't taken hold of it yet, but I'm pursuing it. I haven't taken hold of it yet, but I'm pressing on. I want to. I want to see it. And then he said in verse 13, He said, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. Honesty, man, just honesty. Like, Paul was a little crazy, but he was honest. Kind of like me. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind. Forgetting what is behind. Forgetting what is behind. And straining toward what is is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. The last thing I need you to see this morning is you got to release the weight. Release the weight. In order for Paul to press on, he had to let go of his failures. In order for Paul to press on, he had to let go of what was behind him. In order For him to press on and to go ahead, he had to release what was behind. Listen, you cannot press on in 2020 so long as you're not forgetting what is behind. You cannot press on to a deeper walk with him in 2020, to seeing more of him in 2020, so long as you're still tied to what's behind. You have to release the weight of what's holding you back. You have to release the weight. It's, it's kind of, we're kind of like in the middle of winter here in Georgia. How many of you love the winter? A couple of honest people, right? And then some of you are like, how many of you are praying for summer to be tomorrow? Amen. Spring and summer? Amen. See, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a fall, spring kind of guy, right? Like, get me right, right there in the middle, right? But, <laughs> but honestly, when Christmas is over, I'm ready for spring. Like, I love the winter because it makes me think of Christmas. When Christmas is over, I'm ready for spring. And one of the main reasons that I love springtime is because I have this really, really old Jeep at home. Okay, and I don't like to call it really old because it's actually not even as old as I am. But I have this Jeep at home that's about 25 years old or so. has no AC, no heat. So I just took the top off of the Jeep. I don't ever drive it with the top on the Jeep. I always drive it without the top. So I'm waiting for springtime, right, so that I can drive it again. I only drive it in perfect weather, which is really, like, not going to be until April. (laughs) Unless you're from up north and you're like, oh, wow, it's summer right now. But, like, for me, I'm not driving it until April, right? And there's, like, there's literally no top on it. I take the doors off, just cruising, right? It's amazing. I love it. And right before winter hit, one of the last times I drove it, I went up to the gas station and back, and I had my music blaring. I mean, blaring. They're like, but, you, you know, you got the doors open. Be respectful. Listen, I want to I feel cooler than I am. Okay, so if I got the top off of there, the doors off, and the music's blaring, I feel cooler than I am. I wear my sunglasses because I don't want people to, like, actually know who I am. But, but I feel cooler than I actually am. 
And so I'm driving up to the gas station, and the whole time I'm driving with this music blaring, I just hear this screeching noise the whole time. And I'm kind of like, oh, no, because I know nothing about cars. Zero. Like, if it were possible to know negative about cars, I know negative 10. Like, I know nothing about cars. And I hear this screeching coming out of the Jeep, and I'm freaking out because I don't know how to fix it if it's broken. And I have one really good friend who knows everything about Jeeps, but he is busy with work. And so if it's broken, I'm stuck and I'm in trouble. So I'm freaking out and I turn off the radio so I can hear the screeching noise better. You know we do this, right? So that you can explain the noise to the person who's gonna fix it. So I'm like fully prepared to be an idiot and have to explain to him, like it sound like that. What does it sound like? Oh, I'm sorry, one more time. You know, like, like that. So I turn off the radio so that I can hear the screeching noise fully. <coughs> Finally, I get to the house. I pull in and I park the Jeep and I turn it off and I'm just defeated because I'm like, man, this is just, this thing is, you know, it's right before winter. Should I just sell it? Like what's gonna happen? And I go to push the emergency brake in because it's a manual transmission. <laughs> and when I go to push the emergency brake in, it's already pushed in. So the screeching the whole time was from driving with the emergency brake on. Here's the thing, though. It was screeching the whole time because the emergency brake was on. But it would have completely solved the problem if I would have just released the emergency brake. If I would have just released the brake, there wouldn't have been screeching. The Jeep wouldn't have been driving funny. It wouldn't have been trying, like, to go forward while it's being held back. See, you cannot step forward into what God has for you so long as you're being held back by what you won't let go of. You can't step forward into what God has so long as you won't release what's been holding you back. In 2020, God says there is more and it's time to press on. But you cannot press on until you release the weight of what's holding you back. You cannot press on into what God has for you until you release the weight of what's been holding you back. And it is time to release and to press on. To release and to press on. Somebody, to release and to press on. To release that thing and to press on to release what's been holding you back, to release the failures, to release the doubts, to release the questioning, to release it all, and to press on. God, I know that there's more. I'm releasing the things that held me back last year. I'm releasing the things that held me back 10 years. But God, I'm pressing on to see more in my life. If you're able in this place, would you stand with me, please? In order to press on, we have to be willing to release. In order to be able to press on to see the fulfillment and the fullness of God and all that he has to offer, we have to be willing to release the thing that we've so strongly been holding on to, to let go of it, 